Oh, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. All righty then. Whee, whoops. Good morning, boys and girls. <laughs> so my name is Bronwyn Aker. I am a recovering web developer turned InfoSec enthusiast, cybersecurity enthusiast. And what I want to do is talk to you today about URL hacking, how to identify and annihilate tracking codes in your web links. I have a peeve. And my peeve is I hate it when people share URLs with me without trimming off all of the cruft. I especially hate it when I see information security professionals doing this because we're supposed to know better, aren't we? This is an example of what I mean. Now, this is actually comparatively clean. This is an actual URL that I pulled yesterday or the day before from Amazon looking up a book for someone we all know and love, John Strand. My peeve is not with John's book. My peeve is with the tracking codes in the URL. This is a much better URL. So let me, from this to this. Which one would you rather see in an email, blog post, much better, okay. This is a worse one. I love Daniel Measler. I love his newsletter. This is an actual URL from a newsletter of his that I got. So much nicer, so much friendlier. There's so many, so many ways that this is better. Both of the URLs that I showed you from Daniel will take you here. Same page, same content. So you're probably wondering, why do I care? If they both go to the same place, what does all that extra stuff do? Longer URLs are tracking you. They have query parameters that are keeping track of who you are, what marketing campaign the URL came from, what medium was used to send that URL out into the cyberverse, keywords and phrases that were used in a search. You've probably seen this a lot when you do a search engine query all of the words that you use in the query get stuffed in that URL. That's not an accident. And for, for a search engine search, it's a convenience because then you can take that search query and copy the URL and you know, throw the shortcut on your desktop and you go there right again. No big deal. But for a lot of other reasons, it's not so cool. The possibilities for these parameters are literally endless, literally. And I realized a really good way to help explain this to people who understand technology. All of these key value pairs are kind of like metadata, but instead of being embedded in a document, they're listed, they're included in the URL, but it's still metadata, it's still stuff that is over and above the meat that gets you to a location somewhere on the web, okay? Let's do a little bit of review. This is your very, very basic URL. You have a protocol, you've got domain, you've got your file and your path name. Now, protocol, we know, HTTP, HTTPS, we talk a lot about that. The domain is usually a top-level domain, a secondary domain, and a subdomain. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about those. Your top-level domain, .com, .net, .org, yada, yada. This is a categorical identifier. 
And I'm going to go into more detail about top-level domains because one of the takeaways I want you to have is a greater degree of sensitivity to top-level domains as an important component of URLs. The secondary domain is the persona. Amazon, Netflix, IBM, JPL. You see where I'm going with this? The subdomain originally was a unique identifier for a single machine on a network. Nowadays, if you go to a triple dub, you may be accessing any one of 500 servers in a server farm. But the subdomain really is something within the organization that is a separate portion. One of the best examples of subdomain use I have ever seen is NASA. NASA.gov, if you want to get to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, jpl.nasa.gov. Kennedy Space Center, ksc.nasa.gov. And you can, you can stack subdomains to get even more granularity. So that's your domain name. Everything after that top level domain, until we get to the cruft that we want to get rid of, is your path and your file name. Okay? So I see a lot of nods. I'm not going to belabor this. Let's talk about top level domains here for a second. Originally, when the internet went public, there were what I like to call the magnificent seven. .com, .net, .org, .edu, .gov, .mil, .int. Com, commercial. Net, network. Org, nonprofit organization. EDU, degree granting educational institution. .gov, initially, it was only federal level United States government agencies. Now you can get .govs all the way down to the city level. .mil, military. Whose military? Our military. Okay. Dot int. This is one you probably may never have heard of. Initially, I, and I need to double check, but dot int was dual personality. Dot int is, would be either an entity for maintaining the infrastructure of the internet, or conversely, it would be an entity or organization created as a result of an international treaty. Not many people are ever going to see a .int or care. Nowadays, we have more. We've got .biz, .info, .me. Most of those other top-level domains are still going to be three characters or more. But I want to call your attention to the two-character top-level domains. 99.725% of top-level domains that have two characters only are country code specific. The uh, International Standards Organization, you've heard of them, has a list of two-character codes for um, different countries and .us, United States, .uk, United Kingdom, .ce, um, Switzerland, I think. No, ch is Switzerland. But .ru, Russia. .cn, China. .tv is an interesting one. Has nothing to do with television. .tv is the country code specific top level domain for an island nation called Tuvalu. And before all of the extra uh, top level domains were available, they licensed the rights to .tv to make money. And there, at one point, the income generated for domain registrations with .tv exceeded their gross national product. Okay. So the takeaway here, if it's a two-character top-level domain, it's probably for a country. So just be aware of it, because maybe you don't want to go to something that's being 
you know, from that other country. Or maybe you want to make sure that you really are getting to something from that country. So you will see things like .com .uk, .com .whatever, .gov .tv. You never know. Be wary of them. Be aware of them. Also, watch out for puny code domains. I could do an entire three-hour talk about puny code. I'm throwing it out here because, again, I want to raise your awareness. And remember, you're not being paranoid. They really, really are out to get you. All right, so let's go back to this wonderful URL and break it down. Key elements to be aware of. The protocol, the domain, the file path, the next thing I want you to pay, aware, pay attention to is a question mark. The question mark is an operator. It's a query operator. And it delimits, it's going to separate this, the file path from the key value pairs. And this is where your key value pairs, all of this stuff that comes afterwards is always going to be key value pairs. You have a key, a value, they come together, they help to identify what's going on. And you can piggyback them by using an ampersand. The ampersand is an operator that lets you stack these like cars on a train. So, that obnoxious URL with line breaks, so you can see how it works. MailChimp, okay, it's a .mp, it's a two character, but again, we. There are two character TLDs out there that aren't country code specific. But then you see the file path. That's to get to the meat of where that article is. Question mark, now is where we get into the codes. E equals, and a unique identifier. I'm guessing that E represents email. That's mine, be nice. The ampersand. I want to add more stuff. UTM source. Anywhere you see UTM, that's a Google Analytics key value pair. And I, I believe the U stands for Urchin, which was a tool that has since been retired. But again, UTM, Google Analytics. So the other lines, I left the ampersand at the beginning because I wanted to fit everything on one slide. So UTM campaign, what was the marketing campaign? UTM medium, what media was used to send this out? UTM term, not quite sure what that means, but you know, urchin, Google. Now we get into MCCID. Gee, the code for MC, MailChimp maybe? is pretty much the same as what was in the E for email, right? Seeing some duplication here. MC, oh, let's see, CID, sorry, campaign, EID, email. Starting to see how you can analyze these yourselves. And again, the cleaner version, so much nicer. Email marketing and tracking is benign. I don't like being tracked. Your mileage may vary. Tracking codes are annoying. They feed the marketing monsters that drive targeting, targeted ads. Most targeting codes, like I said, benign. There are ways, I'm positive, that they could be used for malicious ends. Things like stalking, profiling. Can you think of anything? I bet people here could. Go oh, yes, the Google Calendar. There you go. So not all URLs are benign. Be aware of the URLs. Key takeaways I want you to, to walk away with. URLs are everywhere. They are in web pages, social media, email, mobile apps, being aware of your URLs is crucial to avoiding phishing and spear phishing campaigns, malicious payloads, other badness like the Google campaign, 
Understanding how URLs work gives you power. I want to empower you. Other reasons to sanitize your URLs? They're cleaner and friendlier. They protect your privacy and the privacy of your friends and loved ones. They're easier to follow. Which brings us to our conclusion. Now that you know, stop. Take a moment, trim the crud off before you share your favorite cat pictures. You love cat pictures, right? Just take a moment and be nice. That's it. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. The question is, what about Proofpoint and uh, in-house tools that will add information for tracking URLs within an organization? That's an appropriate use, and it, this is where most of what I'm covering has to do with you working as an individual to protect your own privacy. Within an organization, the rules change because the organization has to be able to track where possible malicious things came from, and you, you know, when you work for a company, you really don't have privacy. If you're accessing anything on their system, on their network, it's theirs, not yours. This is more about protecting yourself. Other questions? Yes, sir, you. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what about receiving a link to a document that had embedded a code that was an ID that you needed to access the document? If someone is using an inline code in a URL to access that document, they're doing security badly. And they need to, they need to get with the, with the plan and do it better. Yeah, a lot of organizations are very bad about that, but embedding things like user IDs or um, release codes, authentication codes in the URL, that is, that is a security no-no. If, if it, it can be hex, but it's still plain text. Anybody can read it. If you've got a man in the middle, yeah, you're, you're toast. Do we have time for one more question? All right, thank you very much.